so the lies behind the phylogenetic trees, the place of social science in Pangaea. So, um, yes, so there is a life behind a tree. So the social sciences, I'm not going to give you a long lecture about social science, but just is very broad, um, the study of human society and social relationships, and there are many disciplines um, within it. I think that's important to say. So I'm a social anthropologist by background, but there are many social scientists who have different disciplines from me. I also wanted to say something very briefly about theory and method, because I think that when people from outside social science um, think about social science integration into clinical, medical, whatever research, they tend to think that it will be someone who come, you know, comes along and adds a method. And I think um, it's important to think that we actually have a broader um, number of tools and approaches in our, in our suitcase, if you like. So, and all our research and um, of different disciplines tends to be cyclical. It's not a linear process. And I think that one of the critical things that, that we often do is we, we start off with a question and a topic. We think through our research strategy. We, that informs the methodology, the approach to data collection. And we interpret, look at the analysis, and then we come back, maybe do further data collection, and that informs theory. So it's more of an iterative process. It's not particularly if the data um, tell us something that we hadn't expected, then um, it may take a new angle. It's not necessarily always in the process from we're going to to look at this, and therefore we're expecting this hypothesis to be proved or not. We often have a lot more questions than that. And also to say that social science includes both quantitative and qualitative approaches, and it, those methods, those approaches tend to be on a continuum. So that's my tiny little bit of background on social science. I want, I want to um, focus mainly around some of the work we've done in the molecular and epidemiology studies here in Uganda. I'm sitting in, Te in Tebi now, as is Deo and Nicholas. Um, and to the examples and the things I'm going to talk through are from this long-running study. I think it's more than a decade that um, this work has been going on. You can see um, four of the five objectives here that the to determine the distribution and trends of HIV, determine the sources of new infection, use the historic stored samples, and then to understand how to improve risk tra and transmission reduction efforts. Those are things that, that Nicholas and Deo have, and Pontiano, of course, have talked about um, in, in the past. And indeed, this aspect as well. And this is the part that brought in the social science and indeed the epidemiological data and to, to identify transmission linkages and networks within high risk and general population cohorts. So we had a part of the protocol, the long running protocol, which has been integrating social science into this very broad range of molecular epi studies. Don't try and read the abstract. I've just put it up so that you get the title. And this is just sort of one of the earliest studies we did, um, which really gave us some sense that we may have something interesting here if we put um, methods together. So there was, this is with, um, our, with the, the clinic that we have in Kampala, which has been serving women at, at high risk for HIV for over a decade. And early on, obviously, collecting samples that was of interest to the basic science work. But we were also, we had a social science component where we were trying to understand not only how women came into sex work, but also the different types of, of sex work, transactional sex, and the lives, if you like, the rounded lives of women um, in these, in, who attended the clinic. So we ended up collecting, we had 1,027 women enrolled in the clinic. We have um, 200 life history and relationship histories 
from those women. And we found when Deo, who led this paper and the analysis um, with Nikkeis, who was with us at the time, when, when you looked at what was going on with the phylogenetic tree, we actually had information from some of those women, not only on their relationships and so forth, but also where they were working, where they were, were getting their clients. And from that, we were able to insert into this analysis um, information which showed that these were women who had, at a particular point, been working in the same bars. So the missing link in these pairs and the one tri triplet of women that we were able to link up with social science data was obviously a man. Um, and that actually we were able to say, okay, this, this is these, these, this transmission is occurring in a short period of time amongst sex workers who are working in the same place. So this gave us some indication of what um, we may be able to do um, further. Another um, study that, that also gave us um, some insights into connecting the um, disciplines was um, early on our work in fishing um, communities. This is 2008 to 2010. And again, we were collecting mobility, life histories, and the, the um, phylogeneticists and so forth were looking at the samples. And one of the things we found that we had a man with a wife in Entebbe and um, someone with a very closely linked um, subtype of virus was in one of the fishing sites and the social science data showed well actually it was the wife um, who'd been with for some time who was in Entebbe and it was a girlfriend relatively new girlfriend in the fishing site but interestingly both of those women were complaining about all the other um, girlfriends he had so we had some insight into the mobility of this this man which again um, just put some information about his his movements his um trajectory if you like on on his fishing career going around the lake um through through the information we had so the main work i'm going to talk about is a is a much more structured study those those two studies were a little more opportunistic by we were doing data collection the social science data collection and it complemented um what was going on on the on the um, phylogenetic side, but then for the molecular epi study, we then more formally had um, the elements which we were joining up, purposely joining up, and collecting the social science data specifically to respond to questions from the phylogenetic data. So you've heard about the general population cohort in Chemaliwa. Um, I expect before 25 study villages. We set it up in 1989. We're now in our um, 31st year, um, and it's in um, southwest Uganda. This is the um, stylist, stylized map showing Chemaliwa subcounty. The the yellow stripe through is the road going south to Masaka. This is another stylized GIS map and. You can see on this, this is um, showing each dot is a house, um, or the, the villages within the general population cohort, and some of the, the basic um, data that we have on being able to see where, where people live. Now, for each of those dots, we have census data, so we know who's in the house, their age, their sex, their um, education, etc. But we also, for the for the adults and for for many of them over a very sizable part of that 31 years, we know about their their medical background. That and for 8,000 of those um, adults, we have um, uh, genetic data as well, which was was done. Um, collected in, in 2011. So we have a wealth of data, background data, on these people. Um, that's what it doesn't look like, um, looks like if it's not on a map. This is a green and pleasant part of Uganda. Um, 
but this is also the uh, got trading centers. This is the main trading center in the center of the, the sub county. And um, in 1989, when we we set up the co cohort, and I was indeed there. Um, it was a smaller trading centre, but it, it was chosen very much because it was rural. It was, however, connected by a, a mud um, Murram road to the main highway to, um, to Kampala and then south to Tanzania, Rwanda and the DRC. And in his doctoral thesis in 1996, Dan Mulder, the late Dan Mulder, the founding director of the MRC, described the search for, for the, the site and what, what we were looking for um, in the late 1980s. And the aim was very much to find a place, interestingly, that had a stable population, to look at the um, epidemiology of HIV in a stable population to the south, Rakai set up one year before, had a more dispersed cohort. The, the GPC was set up purposely to be in a contiguous set of villages. And one of the things that, that is very striking to me from his thesis was that Chemerly was, was selected um, for a number of reasons, including because initial data showed that in and out migration was relatively low with an annual rate of the order of six to seven percent. So one of the questions that we were asking, thinking about the molecular epi work, was actually what place does mobility play in recent infections? So that, if you like, was one of the things that prompted us to think about what we were asking of the data and why we wanted to do this study. Now, I was the one who was um, actually set out the sample um, for the social science work. And I just put this up so you can see I actually worked from hand drawn maps to um, select the sample. And the sample that we looked at in the social science was to take the 21 incidence cases that were confirmed in the period 2012-2013, so this is quite some time ago, um, and to actually use that as the base for our sample selection. So what I did, if you think of that rather crudely drawn hand map, was to take, put a circle around a group of, of homesteads which, in which there was one where somebody, one of those 20, 21 um, people who'd recently become infected lived. A critical part of this was I'm the only one who knew which that house was. The, the, the team who collected the data were blinded to that. And critically too, I made sure I didn't choose a middle house. It was a, a circle around a group and somewhere amongst those houses was someone who'd recently um, acquired the HIV. So just to reiterate on the broader study, so the wider molecular epi study sampled prevalence cases. So we had, a, at that point, we had approximately 500, as well as these new incident cases where people had consented for their archived samples to be used for future studies. So Deo and team were, were, were um, working on that. The social science component, we drew, I drew the, the circle to make a cluster of about 10 houses, which included someone who'd been recent, recently become HIV positive. And out of that, we ended up with um, in-depth life history interviews with 102 participants. A number of adults we could not um, reach, but we actually did very well in terms of um, the number of people from those houses we were able to, to talk to. And we focused particularly on their mobility and on their relationships. So I think the main overriding finding, which really belies what Dan um, was, had pointed um, us to, me to, in that early work, 
was that we found no differences in the mobility or relationship profiles according to HIV status. The, 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 the everybody, nearly everybody had been mobile at some point in their lives, usually in their late teens or 20s, often for work, going to fishing sites, towns and cities. And women, women also move because of marriage, but also for work. And I think that this really helped us to review how we had defined migration and mobility in the GPC across time. And, and often um, it had been too, too um, focused on long-term migration and we hadn't paid enough attention to people who spent a night or two away. And that actually led to us um, reassessing how we asked about mobility in the GPC. I told this story um, in the meeting in, in um, Som Kelly not so long ago, but I will um, tell it again to indicate some of the data that we got very specifically from the people who'd recently become HIV positive and the stories behind um, their, how they had become HIV positive. This isn't a real map. I drew it myself for this. And so basically we, we do make an effort not to, to identify um, these particular people. So, um, and this is a story from uh, something that happened 2011, 2012. So it's a while ago. So the house at the top that's ringed has a young woman in her 20s um, living in it who had um, a few years before married a much older man. He was in his 50s, 60s. And then she what had, be was, had recently become HIV positive. Her husband was HIV positive. Um, but when you look at the phylogenetic data, their virus was different. So she had not acquired the subtype from the man. But from the data that, that um, Deo and his team had on um, the, from the phylogenetic trees, the man living in the house ringed at the bottom um, had a very similar virus to her. And what we found from the social science data was that the older man, the woman's husband, had um, been widowed um, a few years before, probably 10 years before. And he had, and he was of Rwandese origin, as quite a number of people in the area are. And he linked up with someone who was providing opportunities for young Rwandese women to um, get work and you know get opportunities in Uganda. Now, one of the things was providing um, husbands for them um, for a price. So she had come to this, air, this village um, to marry this man through this arrangement. And he was a much older man. She was a young woman. And I think not, you know, not surprisingly, um, she probably was quite attractive to other people. So the man um, down the road was in fact ended up becoming her her boyfriend, if you like. And so the story behind this was, well, actually, um, if you think about key populations and people at risk, you wouldn't necessarily think a young woman marrying an older man in this area would necessarily be thought of as, as being at risk um, of infection. And it wasn't the risk of infection from her husband. It was actually through a liaison further down the road. And we, that sort of story helped us understand a little bit more about some of the, <clears throat> if you like, the vulnerability of some of these women who were in good faith coming for what they hoped were, were fame and fortune and, and good jobs um, in the area. So I'm going to um, wind up. I think one of the things um, that Pontiano once said to me was that it was it was it's helpful to remember the people behind the samples because it, behind each of those dots on the phylogenetic tree is a person and the story of their lives of how they came to be there 
But I think that also, um, you know, stories are interesting. Stories um, can um, be, be good to listen to. But I think it also has helped us think more about risk and to question some of our assumptions about who is at risk. We've already seen that with the phylogenetic data that's showing that fishing sites may be sinks and not sources of infection. And understanding why that happens can be teased out um, through social science approaches. <clears throat> and I just want to conclude by saying something about ethics. In terms of, of how these data are used, Clearly, the more you put together about a person, the more easy it is for somebody to be able to recognize who that person is. So for the first study, I talked about the women in um, Kampala, the six pairs and the, the one triplet. For the, for the publishing that, I not only changed a lot of the details in the stories, I also made composite stories from a couple of the women's um, life histories just to ensure that that if they by chance picked up the paper on the on the um, web, you know, they would not recognize themselves. And the same with how one treats these data that i um, talking about now is just looking for ways to mask identity, but also still be able to bring out the lessons and the understanding from bringing the disciplines together. And that's that.